Hello, everybody. Thank you, Shereen. Um, so uh, let's just get started by looking at uh, a story. Um, we're just going to get started with something truly heartbreaking for 9 a.m. in the morning. But um, it'll be a very brief story. So I'm just, we're going to start right, right away. And we don't have any sound. I'm driving it from Pittsburgh. So let me go cold. back. It's winter. It's Can snowing. I go back? It's a little claustrophobic in her little studio. So I Good. Okay. So I really didn't want to be there. I'm visiting my mother in her assisted living home. It gets old. It gets hard after a while. I'm driving it from Pittsburgh. It's cold. It's winter. It's snowy. It's a little claustrophobic in her little studio. So I say, let's take a walk. She says, fine. We get in her wheelchair, we cross 11 mile, we go into what's a cemetery, and you know, it's a little morbid, but I don't care. And my mother says the same thing every time. What a nice park. Why aren't there more people here? I kind of laugh to myself, but I don't say anything. We go back in, we play bingo. She has a card, she doesn't win. We have ice cream, then we have dinner. Then 6, 6.30, time for bed. Put her in her bed, pull up her covers, push her hair back, kiss her. I tell her I love her, and then she says, this has been the best day of my life. If only Jane were here. So, um, and when we do um, the rest of the videos, can you turn them up a bit? Um, the, um, the real serious study of storytelling, everybody knows that storytelling is incredibly powerful, but um, the real serious scientific study started in 72 with Endel Tulving, who um, began to realize in his brain research that there was a difference between the semantic memory that we all knew about and episodic memory. And uh, he he realized that uh, a, a huge part of the homo sapiens brain is taken up by this episodic memory and by the ability to tell stories. Storytelling may be exactly what defines us as human beings. And, 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 and the great power of storytelling it seems to be that it allows us to transmit big hunks of very important data and persuasion that are sort of glued together with this emotional bond. And so now we have brain researchers who are doing um, uh, lots and lots of studies to find out exactly what it is that, that makes stories to begin with. Um, because, you know, they rule our lives. We, we all spend hours and hours a day uh, either watching stories on TV or we hear stories on the news or we're telling stories. We're just, you know, we're surrounded by stories. Stories are what, are what uh, makes this tribe work. And so now scientists are trying to find out um, exactly what are the elements of stories. And uh, uh, recently, I sort of branched out. I'll tell you about the moth in a minute. But recently, I branched out and started to take some, some of, of our greatest raconteurs and film very, very brief stories, like the one that you just heard from Jane Fishman, and see if we can find out w what are the elements that make a story so powerful. Um, and, you know, there are some things that I think w we've known from the very beginning of the moth 17 years ago, that, that all good stories first set up a nest. That is, there's this very, very comfortable environment. And then what we call the ravens are something that attacks that nest. And then if it's a particularly, if it's a beautiful story, there's a moment of revelation at the end. Now, there's a different kind of story. You know, in a Hollywood story, you'll often find that instead of just a revelation, there's actually 
some, some great benefit. But, but usually for the powerful stories that we hear uh, every day, uh, people don't win millions of dollars at the ends of stories and they don't, you know, and they don't win the princess. All they do is they get some great gleam of insight. And the, and the insight is often a very, very painful insight. It's that uh, the world is filled with pain and, and, and we have to find ways to deal with it. But sometimes the insights are very, very gentle. I'm going to show you Jane's story again, Jane Fishman. And I, I, I wonder if you can look and just see if we can find those three um, powerful elements of every story. If you can find the nest and the ravens, and then most particularly, what, what is the insight that Jane comes away with at the end of that story? So if we could play that. So I really didn't want to be there. I'm visiting my mother in her assisted living home. It gets old, it gets hard after a while. I'm driving it from Pittsburgh, it gets cold, it's winter, it's snowy. It's a little claustrophobic in her little studio. So I say, let's take a walk. She says, fine. We get in her wheelchair, we cross 11 mile, we go into what's a cemetery, and you know, it's a little morbid, but I don't care. And my mother says the same thing every time. What a nice park. Why aren't there more people here? I kind of laugh to myself, but I don't say anything. We go back in, we play bingo. She has a card, she doesn't win. We have ice cream, then we have dinner. Then 6, 6.30, time for bed. Put her in her bed, pull up her covers, push her hair back, kiss her. I tell her I love her, and then she says, this has been the best day of my life. If only Jane were here. Okay, so this story has a, has a really uh, interesting structure because it's, you know, when I said look for the nest and then look for the ravens and then look for the insight, you'll see that they're sort of collapsed. Who, who can tell, help me with this? Because if you don't, uh, if somebody doesn't raise their hand, then I'm just going to start picking people. Um, who, can you tell me what... Uh, what the what the nest is in the story? What the what the um, uh, the sort of the domestic situation? And then what is it that attacks that domestic situation? And then what's the insight that that she gets? I get a full answer here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I was wondering. What's your name, by the way? I'm Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Um, uh, is the nest what she says at the very beginning about? You can put that closer to you. Oh, about visiting when she's like, I'm vi visiting my mother in the assisted living right. facility. Get, I mean, that kind of felt for me like a universal right. situation. People right. understand that right off the right. bat, being somewhere that you don't necessarily want to be, but you feel like you yeah. should be there. Yeah. I think, I mean, I mean, to me, the nest is really the whole story in that case. Just, just almost ev everything that happened. Right, because it's all kind of sweet and it's all bearable. It's all good. You want to try? Um, <clears throat> I'm Molly. I think um, you know, like you said, the nest for me was the entire story, the relationship between mother and daughter. Um, I thought the environment that she, um, you know, lays out at the beginning is probably the ravens. Um, you know, she didn't want to be there. No one wants to deal with the long drive and um, you know, poor weather. Um, I'm sure seeing your mother in an assisted living home probably isn't, um, you know, doesn't make a daughter feel um, very, very good. Um, and I think the insight at the end, um, for me, wasn't the very last line she said, but, um, you know, just kind of the moment that she has, you know, right before, uh, you know, her mother says, I wish Jane was here. I think it's just, um, you know, the love between them. Um, right. She kind of... Um, is the one taking care of her mother, it sort of flips, I think, um, you know, the normal relationship between a mother and daughter. Right, right, yeah. I mean, I find it, uh, I, I guess I, I saw that as part of the insight right at the end, but then I thought that the, to me the real insight was that last line, which I still can't even cope with. What do you think? Uh, my name is Eric. Um, 
I think that the, the nest is about the mother who needs, who's in a nursing home. Right. The raven, I think, is hidden, and you don't realize that all of the individual things that the daughter is doing um, turn out to be the raven. Right. At the end, because you think they're part of the nest in that terminology, but then when her mother doesn't realize that she's the one who's doing it, all of those things she did suddenly take on, they flip, and they aren't all warmth and good. It's like, oh my gosh. Right. It's, it's, it's a different side. Right. That great, to me, that great pain at the end, which, um, I mean, I've taken care of uh, uh, parents with Alzheimer's, so, um, and probably most of us here have, just that sense, oh, there's nothing that can be done, but the, you know, there's always that moment when they don't recognize you. But I just thought that she told it so well and with such great vulnerability. Um, I want to talk to you a little about the moth. I, I started the moth back in 1997, and I did it because I had been raised on St. Simons Island, Georgia, and um, surrounded by stories. And then when I was a young man, I used to go over to Wanda's house every Saturday night, and we'd get drunk off lots and lots of bourbon, and we sit out on her porch, and moths would come, you know, wheeling around the lights, and as we got drunker and drunker, we'd tell um, wilder and wilder stories. And I loved those nights, and so years later, I'd had this very successful book and movie, and I was living in New York, and I kind of thought that I, that I was really missing something in my life because there were no stories in New York because you went to cocktail parties and you had banter. But the, y you'd be interrupted in 12 seconds if you tried to tell a story. So I thought, you know, I think there are great raconteurs in New York. I'm just going to find out. I'm going to make people listen. And so I had the moth in my living room, and it was instantly terrible. It was, it was just. People went on and on, and every story had a little moral at the end, and people seemed to have forgotten how to tell stories. But for some crazy reason, I decided not to give up, and we kept having moths. And very soon, I met a man named Jonathan Ames, who uh, just had a show on HBO called Bored to Death. Um, but in those days, he was just knocking around the city. But I brought him in to tell a story, and he did something that I had not seen anybody do. He showed incredible vulnerability and honesty. And the story that he told was when he was 12 years old, he had learned how to masturbate. And he was so proud that he was successful that he came running up to his mother with the evidence and said, Mom, look what I did. And nobody would tell that story. I mean, I feel a little embarrassed about telling it now at 9 a.m. in the morning. But, but his just sheer exuberant honesty won everybody over. And instantly, we learned this principle that has carried the moth now for 17 years. I mean, now the moth, uh, we, were, we were the most successful new radio show in the last 20 years. Um, we're now on 400 radio stations around the country. We have moths. Uh, all over the country. I went to the Moth Slam last night here in Chicago, but we have Moth Slams in 20 cities around the country. Um, our podcast is the third most popular podcast in the world with um, about two and a half million downloads every month. Um, we're now in London and Dublin, and we're uh, expanding to Asia, to uh, Australia and Tokyo. and. So the moth is just booming, and not only is the moth booming, but all the moth clones are booming, all the, all the storytelling groups all over the country that um, are, are gathering people to hear true personal stories in an intimate setting. There's something very powerful about that. And in a way, it can be seen as almost contrary to what you all are doing, because it's saying, let's get away from the internet, let's get away from anything that's commercial, and let's just have these little intimate, intimate nights. But I thought that there's actually a great, great beauty in, in watching personal stories um, uh, on the internet, 
Um, I just think, you know, the problem that we might have had is that the is that when the moth does stories on the internet, you know, they're 10 minute long stories, so people don't really want to watch the stories, they want to listen to them. But these shorter stories, I've, I've just been, just recently started to collect these tales. And uh, I, I'm going to call this Sudden Owl, and, and I don't know when we'll uh, premiere it, three months, six months, depends on how my novel writing goes, depends on how much time I have, but I love collecting these little tales, because I think they are teaching me so much about what the essence of storytelling is. And the essence of storytelling is vulnerability. That ability to show weakness, to show failure. And it's something that's going to be very effective, I mean very important for, for everybody in a retelling environment to learn how a great story always involves a certain amount of confession, uh, an ability to step away from the idea of, oh, I was successful, successful, successful. In fact, when we bring celebrities to the moth, which we do a lot, some of them are beautiful, we just had Louis C.K., um, and, you know, he's amazing and certainly able to show his weakness, but we've had other celebrities, a lot of Hollywood celebrities who just are not able to tell a story about their own weakness. We had a guy who's a you know, a very, very famous writer, if I mention his name, you all would know him. He wanted to talk about his experiences uh, at a wine tasting. And he told the kind of story that celebrities often tell. It's a story of, I went into a situation and everybody around me was screwed up, but I managed to power my way through. And great raconteurs tell the opposite story. Their stories are always, I went into a situation where everybody was being sweet and good, and I was a total clown. I am a clown, and it was revealed then what a clown I am, and that I will never get over being a clown. But that story that he was telling about, about his wine experiences had to end with a challenge from this leading wine expert that he would never be able to tell what kind of a Merlot this was, and, and, you know, he took a sip and realized it wasn't a Merlot, that that was, that it was some, you know, in 1949. Some, you know, the kind of stuff, I just, nobody cared. There was sort of a groan <laughs> in the audience. But that's the stories that a lot of times if you're in retailing, you feel if you're going to tell a story, it needs to be filled with success. And it does need to have elements of success. That is very important but there also needs to be a moment of great vulnerability. So let's watch another story and see if we can see um, some of the vulnerability in it. If you'll turn off the lights and we'll... When I was growing up in Jersey City, I wasn't a bad kid, I was just a little mischievous. In summer school, one of my buddies wanted to buy a gun. I just happened to know a guy who was selling the gun, Lenny. So I went to Lenny's and I picked up the gun and the next day I brought it to school. Well, Frankie, before he bought it, he wanted to test fire it. So we took it down to this swampy area down by the Hackensack River and we set up some cans. Pop, 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 pop. You know, we were shooting at the cans. Next thing I know, I heard some other pops, but they weren't my pops. I looked over and I saw this big bald-headed white guy with this crazy look on his face and he was shooting at us. And I could hear the bullets whizzing in the weeds past my legs. I wasn't waiting to find out why we were getting shot at. We just took off running. And I don't think we stopped running for about a week. Later, I gave Lenny the 40 bucks that he wanted for the gun. But I charged Frankie 50. And I kept the extra 10 for myself. And we bought beer. And we were sitting around drinking beer, laughing about what happened. And I think that's when me and Lenny decided we were going to become cops. <laughs> so... So let's talk about that one. So the, so, so the vulnerability, how does he show his vulnerability? What's your name? Linda. Linda, here. I'll give you that. Hold it up close to you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, how does he show his vulnerability? I think he's a, a, a kid that's kind of maybe going down the wrong path. Right. And he's vulnerable to that, and uh, he's scared, and then they make a decision. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, is there anything else that shows his vulnerability? <coughs> who, who else? Like... Something that he's willing, that he's willing to sort of admit that not everybody would be. 
Yes. Oh, great. That's what I love is when the hands start coming up and I feel like here. It's he, he, where? There you go. Good. What's your name? Uh, my name is Alex. Um, perhaps the fact that he's an officer, but when he was young, he illegally sold the gun and fired it and drank beer when he was underage. Right. Right. And arbitraged his friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, exactly. He's, he's not, you know, he's willing to do that last line. He knows the last line is going to be a joke. And he knows why everybody's going to laugh. You're going to laugh because, you know, he's kind of a bad kid and he's talking about a lot of things that a cop shouldn't be involved in, but we all know cops are involved in. And, and so out comes this this great honesty, and because of the honesty, we are madly in love with him. Um, Mark Twain went, uh, went around the country with this story uh, about his experience as a Confederate soldier, um, uh, a private history of a soldier, and in which he admits quite openly that he was lazy, that he was a complete coward, and that finally he was a deserter. And while his publishers refused to publish the story, as soon as it got out and he went on with the lecture circuit with it, it's the story that everybody demanded to hear because everybody wants to hear the stories by people who are not afraid to show us uh, what frauds they are, what total clowns they are. When I, well, I gave uh, the Moth Award a couple of weeks ago to Louis C.K., and uh, when I did, I said that uh, Louis C.K. Will, um, will tell us about people who inspire volcanic hatreds from him, who are actually fairly reasonable and sweet people. And he'll tell us about how bored he is with his kids and how uh, every date that he goes on leads to abysmal despair. And he's not afraid to show us, you know, that he's, that, that he's a total loser. And that's where his power comes from. He, he presents himself as the worst fuck up on earth. And because of that, we think that he is this powerful raconteur, maybe the best raconteur on the planet now, maybe the best storyteller uh, on the planet. And if, and if you start thinking about American storytellers who became extremely successful, Abraham Lincoln, you know, is another one. His campaign knew how to use his failures, the fact that he had lost election after election after election, and that he was just this ordinary guy. Now, he also had a great strength to him, but he could always present himself as a loser. When Bill Clinton ran, uh, you know, in 92, he ran uh, talking about what his loss for the, gov for the uh, governorship of Arkansas had meant to him and what it taught him. And when Richard Nixon came back in 1968, it was in part because Americans loved him that he had lost, not only in 60, but in 62. That when we elect people, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan had lost uh, primary campaign after primary campaign. And when we see people lose in America, we have an immediate attachment. We're excited by them. And, and it's, uh, it's so important to be able to show those losses. I'm going to show you a video now of a man who is, uh, I, I don't know if you all know him, Neil Gaiman. Um, he's, a, he's one of the biggest writers in the world, and when he goes to give talks, I often go touring with him, you know, we'll go on st storytelling tours. We get 40,000 punk kids come, you know, assailing, trying to get in and see this guy. So when he tells a story, he's got to tell a story, he knows, he has to tell a story about loss and, so, and, and, and about human failure. So let's watch that. Let's I used to worry that I was a disappointment to my dad. He played sports, and I was the least sporty child possibly in the universe. Um, I never scored a goal or caught a ball, caught a run. 
hit a run, whatever you do with runs. But I became an author, and I did a huge signing at Barnes & Noble in Union Square. And afterwards, my agent said, you know, your father was here. And I said, no, I didn't know. And she said, he just came up and he watched you. And she said, I said to him, you must have known this would happen. You must have known Neil would be a best-selling author. And he said, no, my son wanted to be a writer. I thought I'd be supporting him for the rest of his life. But he came and he watched. And I never knew. And that meant the world to me. Okay, a very simple story. Um, and I'm not saying the man does not have an ego. And I think that's clear. Like, he also wants to talk about his success. But, um, but he does want to talk about vulnerability. What, what, do you, what do you think shows his vulnerability in that story? How do you I think the most vulnerable part for him was... Oh, what's your name? My name's Jake. Oh. Um, I think that he was showing his vulnerability really when, um, you know, he said that, you know, he never thought that he would live up to his father's expectations, um, and that even into his adult life, he still you know, didn't think that he really had done anything that made his father proud. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and, and he knows from the beginning that, that, he ha that he has to, you know, he has to talk about that. And that leads me to talk just quickly about this ability to show vulnerability is important um, uh, in in everything that we uh, in everything that we present. If we can tell a story, and for some reason couching our failures in terms of a story makes them sting a little bit less, but if we can tell a story. Uh, and show our vulnerability, it becomes, uh, um, it, it, it then allows us to start showing our strengths. Now, you all know, for example, I'm just going to bring up a quick example. So the, the difference between the story of Apple and the story of Microsoft. Apple has the Steve Jobs story, which is the story about failure. I mean, it's, it's a story that every, um, everybody almost in the world responds to. This is a man who was completely crushed and who came back. Now, it's also mixed with a great, powerful product, which is really important. And this is a man who really knew how to do some things well. But the fact that he had failed makes his story so much more compelling. And when you compare that to the Bill Gates story, the Bill Gates story is a story of nonstop, sort of boring success. He never really had any failures that he ever cared about. I mean, Microsoft has had failure after failure, but he never cared. He always had billions and billions. And when you think, this, this is really interesting, because there is a great story there somewhere. right? The story of Microsoft is that they is that the company is owned by dying children in Somalia. You know, that, that, that's where all the profits of the company is going to go to. So, so it really is a story that, that just cries out to be told in a new way that doesn't feel like they keep hammering us with success after success after success. Um, I look at the story of Barack Obama versus Mitt Romney. Now, the, there are lots of different ways to approach Mitt Romney's loss in that election. But I think the key moment was when he was being attacked for Bain Capital. Um, over and over again, people were, you know, obviously, he was exposed for that. So his comeback, I thought, should have been Here's a chance to show that you're a bit of a failure. Um, here's a chance to show some sort of weakness, to say, you know, uh, in some ways I screwed up with Bain Capital. 
I did send jobs overseas, and that hurts me now. But instead, he came back with, you know, everything that we did at Bain Capital was actually for the good of the country and for the good of the economy in the long run. And maybe people got hurt, I'm sorry, but, but and that seemed to me to be that kind of a cocky story that's, that's going to lose you uh, the electorate in America time and time again. That's my little political foray now. Um, let me show you, uh, David Garth was this brilliant uh, political manager, and in 1969, John Lindsay was running for re-election for the mayor of New York. He'd had a terrible first term. It seemed like everything was going wrong. He was, he was just considered Mr. Screw-Up, and Garth and his team had to come up with some approach to deal with that, and so they, they uh, came up with a campaign they called True Confessions, and we're going to just see one advertisement of this campaign. And I have to switch this. I guessed wrong on the weather before the city's biggest snowfall last winter, and that was a mistake. But I put 6,000 more cops on the streets, and that was no mistake. The school strike went on too long, and we all made some mistakes. But I brought 225,000 new jobs to this town, and that was no mistake. And I fought for three years to put a fourth police platoon on the streets, and that was no mistake. And I reduced the deadliest gas in the air by 50%, and I forced the landlords to roll back unfair rents. And we did not have a Detroit, a Watts, or a Newark in this city, and those were no mistakes. The things that go wrong are what make this the second toughest job in America. But the things that go right are what make me want it. Okay, so what do you, so wh what do you all think about that um, approach? Does it work? Is it easy? What do you think? <laughs> Of course it's not easy. You essentially uh, <clears throat> are doing what your opponents want want to do to you, right. and you're going to get ahead of them and do it to yourself. Right. So how is that easy? Right, right. And yeah, yeah it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think it's a good idea? It's a great idea. Yeah. The truth's going to come out. It's just how and when is his choice, and if he waits too long, it's his opponent's choice. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? What's your name again? <coughs> My name's Linda. Linda. Yeah, I agree. I think if you own your failures first, then you get to determine the light that they're shown in. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you own your failures, if you can find some way to present your failures, and you can see, I mean, John, John Lindsay wasn't going wild about his failures. He was, but at least he was owning up to them, which in those days was considered shocking. Um, and it, he, swept back into power and then had another miserable term. Um, but uh, it's, it, it, if you can own your failures, then that will give you uh, the ability to talk about your strengths. So I'm going to show you another video where you're going to see again an example of someone who is just so incredibly honest that we're in love with her. She can tell us any shocking thing. It's my first day of the census, and I'm really excited about going house to house in Brooklyn, knocking on people's doors, asking them, are you black, white, exotic, what's the deal? And as I do, I'm submitting my paperwork, including my identification, my driver's license, when I meet one of my neighbors, Eloise. She turns over and she sees this little dot on my license. She says, oh, honey, what's that about? I say, oh, you know, I'm a donor. In case anything were to happen to me, God forbid. You know, I wouldn't mind giving up a leg, an eyeball, whatever. She smiles and has this glimmer in her eyes. And we become, become quick friends going out to different places in the census, including this one house that was really sketchy in bed -Stuy. She's like, oh, no, 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 honey. That's a crack house. You don't smoke crack, do you, Don? And I turn to her, I say, no, Eloise, I don't smoke crack. Why do you ask? 
She says, Don, I need a kidney. Will you be a donor? I said, hell no. I mean, I'm down for the homies, but I'm not about to get a kidney to some woman I just met from the census. So she's totally, totally willing to be honest about something that nobody else would, would be honest about. That we actually, you know, it would make us so uncomfortable to reject somebody that we would put that story out of our minds. But the truth is that we o open up to her because of that. Now, I, I just want to show you two more stories before we run out of time because I think they're very beautiful and very moving. One, the first will be the story of a mother talking about how she met a man, and the second will be the story of the daughter talking about his funeral 50 years later. So um, let's watch these. When I was young, I signed on as a deckhand on a big, beautiful schooner that sailed the Caribbean. Once, we came into dock in Miami for repairs, and I found myself to be the only one who was really staying on the ship. I used to feed the sea cows scraps, and one day, one early one morning, I looked out and saw bubbles rising up out of the sea. I ran to get the scraps, I ran back, I threw them on the ocean, and much to my shock and delight, a beautiful young man came up out of the midst of them. It turned out that he was a uh, skin diver who had been hired to scrape the barnacles off the bottom of the boat. As he boarded the boat, he uh, had some trouble with his wetsuit, and he asked me if I would help him with the zipper of his wetsuit. That night, I wrote my mother and dad and said, I have just met the man that I'm going to marry. 51 years with that beloved boy who came to me out of the depths of the sea. And now uh, the story from the daughter, 50 years later, just to show how quickly we can be totally grabbed by a story. It's a story less than a minute. The ocean was always a symbol of my parents' love for one another. So when my father died after 50 years of marriage, we decided on a burial at sea. When we set sail that day, my mother told us that if we were to see a dolphin, it would be a symbol, a sign that my father was with us and we could spread his ashes. We saw no dolphin, but we spread his ashes anyway. As we sailed back to the marina, my mother suddenly cried out. I thought it was despair. Then she cried out again and I looked to see a dolphin keeping pace with us. Then my sister cried out, more dolphins. And when I looked again, there were three dolphins. When I looked again, there were five. Then there were 10. Then there were 100. Then there were 1,000. When all was said and done that day, there were 2,000 dolphins, maybe more, who kept pace with us. It was the rarest of occurrences. They call it a superpod. Dolphins as far as the eye could see. Um, who wants to say what their favorite line in that story was, or the favorite anything? Come on, raise a hand. Or if you didn't like any of it, just you can say, I didn't like any of it. What's your name? Uh, my name's Tom. Um, I, I personally just like the emotion she showed at the very end. Yeah. Right, that to me was the... You could tell that she had kind of been crying before she started telling the story maybe a yeah. little bit, getting ready for it. Um, but then when she said dolphins as far as the eye could see and then she kind of started crying. I mean, that's just, again, she is showing total openness and, and vulnerability in that moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyone else? 
have a comment? I, I just want to say the reason that story works for me is that I wouldn't have believed it if she hadn't said a super pod, the rarest of all occurrences. If she just said, oh, there were thousands of dolphins, I would have thought, oh, she's exaggerating. In fact, she not only didn't exaggerate, but that day it was reported in the news there were 20,000 dolphins that had just appeared off of Los Angeles that day. So I don't know. I don't know where that comes from. I guess the point, though, that I'm trying to make is that these stories are an emotional way to grab people. And they can be done through humor, and it can be done through um, heartbreak. But I I in your environment, in your work, you can use these all the time um, as, as the most important way that human beings connect with other people is is through learning to tell a story, and it's either a story about you or something about your product, um, or it's just a, a way of presenting stories of, of the people who use your products. But those stories are so important and so emotional. We're going to do something tomorrow, a, a little experiment, and we'd like you to sign up. Um, I'm gonna have, we're going to have a little moth slam. Um, so we want you to think of a, a four-minute story that you can tell, a personal true story um, about on the subject fish out of water. When you are, were, you know, you were in some situation that you were completely at sea. And um, if, and then I will uh, do a little quick rehearsal with you this afternoon. Um, if you'll sign up at the registration desk, um, if you're interested then uh, sometime uh, maybe 2 o'clock this afternoon or 3 or something, I don't know exactly, uh, but, but, but we'll do like a quick run through of your story and then tomorrow we'll present your story, a little mini moth that we'll have right here. So that'll be, uh, you know, it's really important that you do this if you're in the retailing business because you have to learn how to tell your stories. And we'll start with a four-minute story because one minutes are impossible. Um, I have three minutes, so I guess that means I have time for one question, Monica. Shall I take a question? Okay. Uh, if, so if anybody has a question about the moth, or about me, or about any of the storytellers, or how you become a New York City cop, um, I, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Let's be, here we go, okay. Do you have any suggestions on how to translate a story within a business environment? Because it, this is almost, I'll uh, say theatrical, but it's more personal. Right. But if you're trying to sell someone something, how do you, and, and, and deal maybe with some uh, vulnerability, which isn't something you normally do when you're trying to convince someone of something. Right. So maybe that's the question. How do you use a story to help convince someone of an ultimate goal. Right, and, and that's, a, uh, you know, that, that's a good question. We have a moth corporate program, so we go in, into corporations, and, and that's something that we're, you know, that we're always talking about. Um, because, because as you point out, it really is a difficult thing to do. You don't want to ever show that, you, that there's a weakness to your product, so you really are, you know, you don't want to be focusing on that. You don't want to focus on the vulnerabilities of your product or yourself, but but I do think, and, and maybe you picked up a little from that example, um, you know, in the Lindsay ad. There there are ways that I think that you can address. Um, I am a human being, and I think um, you know that's something that we can sort of experiment, you know, with workshops. Um, the moth uh, would be happy to come in and you know do workshops with you all. But there are, there are, I think, ways when you're first presenting yourself to start with a story that shows that you're a human being, but also shows that you have a great deal of inner strength and confidence. That was the one thing about all of these stories today. They're all told by people who are willing to expose themselves. Uh, but they are all really, really confident that they can do certain things. Abraham Lincoln felt, you know, totally, uh, um, like, like a failure about so many things.
but he was also completely confident that he was the man for the job. And, uh, and the same with Steve Jobs. When, when he was fired, you know, he admitted he felt terrible, he felt devastated, but he also knew that he was the one who could lead Apple back to success. So, yes. Is there another? One more? One last well, one. Well, I guess it was similar, which is as you look at companies or brands or out there, do you feel, besides Apple, anybody that gets what you're talking about here and does it well, that, that, delivers, a, that delivers stories kind of consistently? Do you, you know, do you see any brands out there or companies out there that you think just does a, do gr does a great job of telling stories about their business besides, you know, Apple, everybody knows that story. No, you know, this is, that, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I don't see it enough. I mean, people uh, have, you know, talked about Dove, for example, you know, seeing an example of a company that, that, that has really learned how to use its client stories. Um, and they're very, very vulnerable stories in a way that, um, that makes everybody seem real. Um, and, uh, you, know, I, you know, I see a few others. Uh, you know, years ago, Volkswagen was the, was, you know, the leader of saying, look, we're, you know, we make ugly little cars. Um, but, uh, but they really run well and they're cheap. And Avis could say, we're only number two which nobody ever wanted to say in those days, and, and say, but you know, that makes us try harder. So for years, people do it, but I always feel as, I feel as though people don't ever do it enough. Because I, I feel that making that human connection is so important that if people are willing to take that little risk, that they will, um, that, you know, that it will always prove to be beneficial. I, I would think with any, like when, when I see advertisements on TV, and maybe this is just from the standpoint of a storyteller, I see these advertisements and there's car chases and there's you know, helicopter shots and I always think all you need is one person sitting there and telling the story of how they use this product for the first time. And if it's, if, if it's a person who is honest and who we trust um, will be swept away, my opinion. At any rate, I think we're out of time. So I thank you all so much.